Tonight's story takes us on the emotional roller coaster that the police and the relatives of a kidnapped victim are put through once a loved one is snatched from his family. It is an extraordinary account of technique and perseverance pitched against a determined evil man who held all the aces. And just when you think there are no more turns the improbable plot can take, real life throws up a final twist in the tale. Children, have you? Stay quite still. This is a loaded shotgun. I'm not going to hurt you. I'm only interested in cash. I am a very reasonable man. But if you don't do as you're told, the others downstairs will get nasty. Cuff him. <laughs> Come on, Deborah. You heard me. Cuff Victor's hands together. Put some tape over his eyes. And his mouth. <laughs> Deborah, over by the table. <laughs> when you're free, read this. But under no circumstances, call the police. Get up. You're coming with me. Thirty-two year old Victor Cracknell was the son of Desmond Cracknell, a millionaire food broker. His kidnapper was Keith Rose, a failed small time businessman. He'd broken into Victor's house, then steadied his nerves for a couple of hours. He'd been waiting for the early morning when people's sleep is thought to be at its deepest before he made his move. Desmond Cracknell, we're informing you that your son Victor has been taken hostage by a People's Revolutionary Group Active Service Unit. If you want your son free without harm, you pay one million pounds in three days, or your son will lose a finger, ear, or nose. Police may not be informed. Hello? Yes, it's me. Victor? The flamboyant businessman wasted no time. Despite the kidnapper's warning, Desmond Cracknell contacted the police straight away and broke off his holiday in the West Country. Surrey police asked him to meet them at a secret rendezvous point away from the house. There, the couple met Detective Chief Inspector Mel McVickers, the man who would lead the hunt for their son. Yeah, thanks. Well, no, I mean, of course I've got rivals, business rivals, but nobody I call an enemy. I mean, nobody do anything like this. OK. Well, the first thing to tell you is that our priority will always be your son's life. That comes before everything else, the arrest of the kidnappers, the ransom money, anything. Well, that's good to know. But we would like to catch these people, and for that we'll need your help. Every time you come in contact with them, try to buy us some time. 
The longer we can delay handing over the ransom money, the, the more time we'll have to prepare ourselves. Of course. I'll do my best. McVickers got agreement for a media blackout. He then moved Victor's wife and children out of the kidnap house and smuggled his men inside, posing as gas men. Good oh, morning, uh, British gas. More than 24 hours had now passed since the kidnap. It had quickly been established that because of modernisation work at the local exchange, it would be impossible to trace calls into the house. McVicker's only chance of catching the kidnapper now lay with the ransom drop. Desmond Cracknell. This is Mr. Murphy. I'm part of the group holding your son. Do you have the money ready? Now, wait a minute. I haven't got as much money as you think. We may have a multi-million pound turnover, but it doesn't mean I can lay my hands on a million pounds just like that. And besides, things aren't too healthy with the business at the moment. I'm going to need time. And I want proof that Victor is still alive. Don't forget it's your son's life you're playing with here. It's up to you whether you see him again. We'll be in touch. Desmond Cracknell managed to convince Rose that he could only raise £130,000 ransom money. For proof that his son was still alive, Rose sent Mr Cracknell to a phone box near the Surrey village of East Clandon. Yeah. I can see the stretch marks on the tape. You're going to need a reminder to be a good boy. What are you going to do? It's 
been 40 years now. That's about as far as we can push it. The father is being brilliant, but I'm getting concerned about Victor. If he has been kept outside, he'll be in a bad way by now. Mm. I think we should push them to make the drop today. So what's your plan? My feeling is it's going to be in the country, so we won't be able to stick close to the father. I'm going to risk fitting a tracking device to the keys. Desmond? Desmond? Desmond Cracknell? Answer this question, yes or no. Are the police involved? No. We have devices which scan all frequencies. If any transmitters are being used, we will know. Now, I want to know you are who you say you are. Answer these questions without hesitation. I know you're a qualified pilot. What is V1? R rotate. V2? Single engine flyaway speed. VMO? Um, oh, <laughs> Christ, I... I can't remember that one. You served in which branch of the service? Uh, f f fleet air arm. Tell me the name of an aircraft with a contrary rotating propeller. The Westland Wyvern. OK. Uh, look, I can get your money now, but you promised me final proof that Victor was still alive. Go to the phone box near the cricketer's pub at Downside in Cobham. There's another tape behind it. Bring a copy of today's Daily Mail with you. After you've got the tape, drive to the bank and pick up the money. Then go back to the house. It's me. Victor. I'm going to read you a headline from the Daily Mail for August the 17th, 1989. Page three. Nail varnish, a bad bet for casino girls. <laughs> Do what they want. Do what they tell you, Dad. I'm in, a, I'm in a place where no one can find me if they left me. Desmond Cracknell. Have you got the money? Yes. Listen carefully. Take the A31 to Farnham. Turn left at the craft centre and proceed for one kilometre. Now, you must come back by the Shepherd and Flock roundabout. Go alone, or you'll never see your son again. McVickers ordered his men to keep as good a watch on Mr Cracknell as they could without getting too close to him. Again, McVickers had to assume that the kidnapped gang, as he still thought he was dealing with, would also be watching Mr Cracknell. Bentley travelling towards Craft Centre. Once the drop had been made, he would have to rely on a tracking device hidden in the case containing the money. Then things started to go wrong. There's no gravel lay-by. Proceed for one kilometre. You'll see a lay-by on the left. You'll see a public footpath next to the lay-by. In fact, Rose's instructions were inaccurate. The footpath Rose had been talking about was only a hundred metres past the craft centre, not a kilometre. Eventually, Mr Cracknell left the money in someone's front garden. Totally the wrong place. Even worse, he then forgot to drive back past the Shepherd and Flock roundabout as instructed. Desmond Cracknell? Where's my money? Why haven't you done the drop? What do you mean I left it exactly where you told me to? Don't play games with me. Your son's life is at stake here. No, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. I, look, I can tell you exactly where I left it.
With the surveillance team still under orders to keep their distance, Rose was able to grab the ransom without being seen. The team still didn't know what car he was driving, but with the tracking device they could at least follow the signal. McVickers could have ordered his men to close in, but if there were others holding Victor, it would endanger his life if McVickers moved too soon. His only option was to follow the ransom money and hope that led him to Victor. He's slowing down. We're getting closer. I think he may have stopped. McVickers sensed a trap. Bombburst. Repeat. Bombburst. The bomb burst code meant the surveillance team had to scatter. Several unmarked cars were simultaneously closing in on Rose, a giveaway if he was on the lookout for a police presence. He's moved off again. I'm getting nothing. Continuous tone. Take a left here. The immediate crisis had been averted, but the bomb burst had forced the team to move out of range of the tracking device. A car was sent back in to try and pick up the target. As the minutes ticked by, McVickers feared the job was slipping through his fingers. Wait a minute, I've got something. It's very faint. Put your toe down, Alex. We've got it. It's heading south southwest. We're just outside Crookham. My man is on the blue transit. Hey, he's pulling over. Just in front of us. Control, forget the blue transit. Repeat, blue transit is not the target. Target vehicle still on the dual carriageway. The bike or the Audi. The bike's turning off at the picnic area. It's the brown Audi. The brown Audi. After a long, high-speed drive westwards, Rose finally pulled up that night outside a house in Exeter and went inside. The road's called Travelich Gardens, a place called Prospect Park. He's coming out. The suspect is on the move again. Over the next couple of hours, Rose inexplicably visited four other houses in the Exeter area, each time staying for a few minutes, then moving on. Then he suddenly left town, heading for the open countryside. And still there was no word on Victor. As the surveillance dragged into the early hours of day five, it seemed as if the drama was reaching a climax. Uh, it's definitely stopped moving. We've been going round and round in circles for the last 15 minutes. The signal seems to be coming from the middle of some woods. I can't see any roads or houses on the map. OK. So follow the signal on foot. This might be where Victor is. Be very aware that he could be down a land drain. Approach as carefully as you can. We're almost on top of it. Must be through those trees. Rose had given them the slip. 
And Victor? He was left to die of exposure, trapped out in the open. But McVickers refused to panic. He concentrated surveillance on the houses in Exeter that Rose had mysteriously visited the night before. After an anxious wait, his strategy paid off. He's definitely on his own. There is no gang. We've been dealing with them for the past five days now, and in that time we've only seen or heard from one man. Now, we can't risk losing him again, so we're going to have to follow him more closely. If he spots us, we'll nick him. What about Victor? If other people are involved, what happens to him if we pull in this suspect? In the event, the question proved academic. Victor had managed to free the wire noose round his neck and had stumbled half blind through the woods he'd been held in until he came across a farmhouse. He was suffering from hypothermia and shock. Victor was safe. It was the news McVickers had been waiting for. Rose was still at the house in Traverditch Gardens. One question was answered immediately. Why had Rose gone to visit those four houses in Exeter? Had there been other gang members? The answer was simply that Rose was in debt. As soon as he'd picked up the ransom, he'd gone straight to the people he owed money to and paid it off, there and then. But this was a story with an extraordinary twist in the tale. Searching through Rose's house in Exeter, McVickers discovered a gun license for two rifles and two handguns, including a Colt Woodsman. Eight years earlier, Juliet Rowe, a local businesswoman, had been shot dead in her own home with a Colt Woodsman. The murder had never been solved, and the motive had remained a total mystery. A ballistics check on Rose's now old and rusty Woodsman revealed, astonishingly, that it had fired the fatal bullets. McVickers believed the murder had been another kidnap attempt. But when Mrs. Rowe hit a panic button, Rose had coldly shot her through the head. On September the 14th, 1990, at the Old Bailey, Keith Rose pleaded guilty to the kidnap of Victor Cracknell. He was jailed for 15 years. It emerged during the trial that he had once worked for Desmond Cracknell, which explained how he knew so much about the family. Among the possessions taken from Rose's home, police also discovered a book on how to commit the perfect crime. The book said that an aspiring master criminal should commit just one offence, which should be big enough to make him permanently wealthy. If that were to fail, he should never try again. Because he did try again, Keith Rose's past finally caught up with him. At the Exeter Crown Court on March the 19th, 1991, he was found guilty of the murder of Juliet Rowe, thus putting to an end eight long years of torment and uncertainty for her husband and her family. For that, he was sentenced to life imprisonment. Good evening. Mm -hmm.